a lot of issues, and we really appreciate um, you prioritizing the time to, to be with us today. So uh, with that, since uh, alphabetically you far outpace uh, Governor Walker, as, as a Venables, I have compassion for those at the end of the alphabet. So uh, uh, <laughs> with that, Representative Garrett, welcome and um, your opening statement. Thank you, Robert. Thank you all for uh, welcoming me here. There are so many familiar faces. Uh, it's nice to see so many of you. Um, let me use my first few minutes to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Um, the, the questions are pretty technical, so um, um, I'll just let you know who I am. Um, uh, my name's Les Guerra. Um, as many of you know, I served in the legislature for 16 years. Um, uh, I'm running because I just, I'm concerned about the future in the state. Uh, I woke up one day uh, uh, over a year ago and I said, I, I don't see opportunity in this state for people who are born with little, for people who are born to damaged families, to those who need the chance to succeed. You know, if there is a chance to succeed that, um, that most people will have if they're born to a great family with great wealth, but we have to also be concerned about those who aren't. And opportunity should belong to everybody, whether you're rich or poor. Um, I personally believe that I think very much because of my background. Um, uh, I grew up in a broken family. Uh, my father had an office in Harlem in New York um, where he was very well loved. Uh, but late one night, night uh, when I was six, somebody came into his office and killed him. And, um, and from then on, I grew up in foster care. And I think that has shaped my view on the world a little bit, and that is that everybody deserves a chance in life. That when I was on the House floor, and I pledged allegiance and I said liberty and justice for all, that that should mean something. Liberty and justice for all. But what I see right now are schools that are reeling, schools that are unable to hire teachers, schools that are unable to retain teachers. Um, I've seen the state where people are turned against each other. You're now told that without revenue in the state, and you're not getting any revenue, the revenue plan right now is unless Russia invades Ukraine, there's no money in the state. That's not a fiscal plan. Um, you're told that you have to fight between a permanent fund dividend or schools or a marine highway or a university or job training. We should be able to do all of those things. And my plan is to say, look, we should get a fair share for our oil. Uh, former Governor Jay Hamden and I were friends and he would always start a conversation with me by saying, first you get a fair share for your oil. We give away $1.2 billion in oil company tax subsidies at the same time we say we don't have enough money for our schools or for mental health treatment or for substance abuse treatment or for a marine highway that this governor proposed cutting by 75% his first year in office which would have shut down the marine highway. Like in South Central we have roads, those are subsidized, the marine highway needs to be subsidized. I'm sorry, transportation is not free, it costs something and it costs even more if we don't provide it to people. So these things matter to me, opportunity matters to me, I want to make sure everybody has a chance in this world for a good job, for a good education. Those are the things that gave me a chance in life and I want to make sure everybody has that chance in life. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Governor Walker, your three minutes, sir. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, accommodating my, my conflicting schedule. I had another, another commitment scheduled before this came up and I, I apologize for not being there in person. It's always my, my preference. Uh, thank you for what you do. I've read your agenda. I think if I was there, I'd probably stay for the whole meeting because it's a very full, exciting agenda. And my congratulations on the $49 million grant you recently received on, on the Mariculture uh, opportunity. So thank you for that. Um, a couple things. Obviously, I, I think I know most of most people. I served as a governor from 2014 to 2018. But uh, my running mate is Heidi Dragas. She is um, Fairbanks born. She's uh, lived in Juneau for the last six years, eight years and uh, married Kevin's son, who's um, well-connected in Southeast with his family and relatives in, in Ketchikan. So Heidi is a great, uh, a great, uh, great running mate and, and, uh, uh, and thoroughly loves living in, living in Southeast. You know, I'm, I'm running. I didn't actually think I, was going, I would run again. I thought we would, we would pull ourselves out with what we did as far as the fiscal plan that we submitted. Part of it was passed, but it was not. Uh, we thought that that would be finished up, and, and it was not. You know, Alaska is, uh, in my opinion, Alaska is full of pent up opportunities, but it's imploding with what we see happening with about $30 million in cuts to the marine highway system in the last uh, four years. Uh, we, we are seeing the results of those cuts now with ferries being tied up uh, in Homer and elsewhere because of lack of crews. 
uh, schedules being down to bare bones this winter is probably easier to say where who will have service rather than who won't because that list is shorter than who who will have service. So it's it's a long uh, it's a long sad story of, of lack of funding on the marine highway system. That's a high high priority. 1,100 teachers short in our state. Uh, no uh, teacher job fair this year for the first time in 30 years because who wants to come to Alaska to be in any part of the system and doesn't have a retirement system. We are seeing the results of what happens when we don't have a fiscal plan. And so we are focused on Alaska digging itself out. We are 49th out of 50 in the nation as far as our economy post COVID. You know, we are, are, are our, uh, you know, our financial situation is, is one, but the opioid crisis is, is back again. It's up 140% from what it was when I issued a declaration of disaster and brought those numbers down. So. It's a matter of, of working as Alaskan. We are a unity ticket, uh, nonpartisan. Heidi is coming from uh, from the left. I come from the right, and we are we are anxious to uh, to work collaboratively with Alaskans and uh, and get us back on track. So thank you very much for this opportunity today. I really look forward to the questions. And last, it's always good to see you. Thanks for thanks for being here today. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we will alternate orders, if I can remember which order we're going in with two, maybe it'd be a little easier than it was yesterday with three. Um, so the first question, both of you have mentioned the marine highway system. You know that's a core, core tenet of Southeast Conference uh, ever since 1958 when we were created as an organization. There's an interesting intersect right now with federal funds that have come in for a very limited time. Uh, there's uh, you know opportunity to use those a portion of those for operations, displaced general fund, um, or they could be used to capitalize, modernize, and uh, create a new fleet of the future. Talk about a leading question. So, what would your priority be and your path forward? Um, and we will start with Governor Walker. You know the the bipartisan infrastructure funds are uh, an opportunity, almost a once in a lifetime opportunity for Alaska. And we will aggressively go after those funds. Some are somewhat earmarked. I know you still use that term anymore, but somewhat designated for the last green highway system. But I think there's always sort of the devils in the details on making sure that the intent is followed through on the actual implementation of that. So we will aggressively go after that uh, as much of those dollars as we can get. Um, this is an opportunity that, that the marine highway system, um, we've never seen this before. We need to be aggressive on that, and, and that's exactly what we'll do, working with Senator Mikowski and her staff and Senator Sullivan and his staff, and, and uh, certainly, obviously, with uh, Congressman Peltola. So you're... Yeah, I talk better standing up. I'm sorry. Um, look, um, the federal infrastructure bill, bill is probably a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us to modernize the Marine Highway Fleet. We've got other problems with the Marine Highway. We, we've, we have 160 fewer workers at the Marine Highway than we did before this administration started. We don't have the workforce. Um, so I think we should focus on using the, the federal funds that are available to modernize a fleet that has 50-year-old ships um, so that at least we don't, at least we have ships that run. Um, look, we've got we've to pay our employees fairly. We've got to have a pension. We've got to be able to attract and retain Marine Highway employees, which, which this state is not doing. You know, neglect is not a plan. And right now, uh, the plan on the Marine Highway is neglect. But I would focus on using uh, these federal funds uh, to build, a, 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 to replace an aging fleet. So the state has the obligation to do the operations. And we have the op uh, obligation to pay our workers fairly and to provide a competitive uh, retirement benefit so people will stay here instead of leave. Thank you. Interestingly enough, Housing's always kind of been a back, back burner issue when we talk about economic development issues, and child care really never even climbed onto our stovetop, if you will. But during a, our spring business climate survey where we had over 400 Southeast uh, business leaders respond to what the hurdles were to economic recovery and their vitality, they mentioned both housing and child care as, uh, as critical issues that needed attention. We'll keep the questions separate on those, but we'll begin with Representative Guerra on child care. How do you see that um, that being incorporated as a, a st with state support? 
Yeah. Um, look, child care is a crisis. I mean, in part, I've been a believer in universal pre-K uh, since I've been a legislator. I've pushed universal pre-K since I started as a legislator. That is not the full child care solution. But, but have, helping students or children enter school ready to read and ready to learn, then you won't complain about third grade reading scores anymore. Child care is expensive. It is too expensive for, for, for too many people. A number of states have found innovative ways to try and um, address the issue, um, including wage supplements. Um, there, there's, a, there's a program in a few states, even Tennessee, called Wages, um, and it helps, uh, helps pay low-paid child, child care workers so that they can, they can earn a wage where they will come in into the industry and where that cost doesn't get passed off to parents who can't afford child care. That is part of it. Um, there are communities, including Juno, that are helping with training. Um, um, we can help with the cost of rent for child care facilities. Um, it's it's going to take state partnership. It's going to take some state investment. Uh, but we should look and see what states are making it work because Alaska is not making it work. And a veto of $4 million from our child care program this year was not a way to make it work. Thank you. Governor Walker. As Heidi and I have traveled the state in the last, over the last year, every community we've been to, every single one, the two biggest issues we hear about is child care and affordable housing. So <clears throat> what we've looked for is, is, you know, solutions, who's doing, who's addressing it in different ways. You know, it's not, it's, the issue is universal, the solution may not be. I look at what Juno has done with, with the child care issue with their CARES funds, and I think they've done an excellent job of that. I've, I've long felt that those closest to the problem are closer to the solution. I would, I would like to see the local government involved. You know, maybe the state provides the funding, of course, but let the local government decide how to, how to administer the, those funds best in their community to get the maximum benefit out of those funds for child care. It's critical. It is the foundation. It's the footing and foundation for rebuilding our economy. If you don't have, you know, a, a affordable quality child care, you aren't going to put our economy back together again. It's a very high priority for us. Thank you. And we'll stay with you, Governor, uh, on the question of housing. How can the state help municipalities with the housing crisis? We need, uh, the, the state needs a land trust. We're, we're one of three states in the nation without a, a, a land trust. And how the land, land trust, the Sitka is a good example of, of the Sitka land trust and what they've done on affordable housing. It's, a, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, I've not seen one like it before. So I would, I would, look, I would look at the Sitka example where the municipality provide the land to the uh, trust and the, and the uh, Rasmussen Foundation, others put in the cost of the uh, utilities. And so what they're selling the house for to the uh, affordable housing um, um, purchaser is based upon just the house itself, not the land, the land's on long-term lease and the utility are of. So there is a, there is examples right in Alaska, right in Southeast, of an excellent opportunity for affordable housing. Thank you. Representative Garrett. Thank you. Um, look, the solution is not going to be the same in every community, but every community in the state has a housing problem um, from, from Ketchikan uh, to uh, Bethel to uh, Seward, you wouldn't think about Seward, but the principal at the high school in Seward commutes two hours every day to Anchorage because he cannot afford a $600,000 house in Seward. The, the problem is different around the state, uh, but it's gonna require probably some state participation. Look, I, I, didn't, I never ran to do something about getting a fair share for our oil. But if we don't, we won't be able to afford any of this. We, have, we don't really have a capital budget anymore. Uh, that capital budget could go to help communities identify housing possibilities and help pay for like a, a fire sprinkler system in, in, a, in a new development. We need to have AHFC be a partner, but all of that costs money. If you want to address the state's problems, you're not going to do it by, by waiting for a once every 30 year uh, invasion uh, uh, like we see right now. You need a fiscal plan, and that includes ending uh, $1.2 billion in oil company subsidies that we could use to build a better and stronger state for everybody. Thank you. And staying with you, Representative Guerra, um, if a, what, is your, what would your plan be to address the high energy costs in rural Alaska? We obviously have haves and have nots in the state, so how do we help rural Alaska with their high energy costs? Yeah. I wish I had more time to talk about um, uh, the money we give away in terms of oil company subsidies. Um, we should be equal partners with our oil industry. They're, they're an important industry, but we should not be junior partners, and right now we are junior partners. Look, we need, we need to build renewable energy projects across this state where they make sense, the kind that makes sense. Um, and that will 
sometimes take state partnership. In rural Alaska, it will take state partnership, right? I am proud to have voted for a renewable energy fund that we have in the state, but it hasn't been funded. It was supposed to be funded at $50 million a year. This year it got $15 million. Last year it got zero dollars. Like we need renewable energy in the state will put people to work. It'll lower energy costs and it'll do something responsible about global warming. Right? Like we have a responsibility to the world and to the next generation, but renewable energy satisfies all three of those things. We can reduce the cost of energy, especially in high cost areas. We can put people to work and we can do something responsible for the next generation about global warming. Those three things are very important and it's a trifecta with renewable energy for us. Thank you. Governor Walker. No, there's a number of things. Obviously, new renewable energy needs to be in the portfolio, but we also have to get through this winter and in the next winter. And so we need to have something more, more immediate while still staying on track with renewable energy, which we have tremendous opportunities. The, the hydro opportunities that, that Southeast uh, has is, is been, has been phenomenal in other parts of the state as well. You know, we, uh, we should have the lowest cost energy in the nation, not the highest, uh, because we are the most energy rich state in the nation. So uh, we have a plan we're working on to bring that down uh, it will require the concurrence with the legislature, uh, but we need to start prioritizing uh, on, on the front burner, bringing down the cost of energy. It impacts uh, commercial fishing, it impacts every, every fabric of our economy is, is the cost of, of energy. So uh, we're working on a, on a plan to, uh, to do just that and to do it on an immediate basis, a midterm and a long-term basis. So we need to bring it down, we need to down, bring it down uh, as quickly as possible, and they need, there needs to be some relief for this winter. Okay, thank you. So a couple of fisheries questions here. Um, it seems that international fisheries management issues have left Alaskans feeling at the short end of the harvest. What would your administration do to ensure Alaska fisheries has its fair share? Governor Walker. Well, a couple of things. One is on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, we need to have representation uh, uh, from Alaska's side that uh, uh, represent, truly represents Alaska. And I know there's a there's a tussle back and forth on those 11 votes. We have six; they have five in in, uh, in Washington. We need to make sure our six um, know what uh, what uniform they need to be wearing. Secondly, on the bycatch issue, we need to be aggressive on the bycatch issue. I have reviewed proposals that were submitted to the board 24 years ago that were still not acted on. So I don't think we need to study the bycatch much more. We need to start have some aggressive actions. And there are some available. Other other locales in the in the world do uh, take uh, more aggressive steps on reducing bycatch, and we need to do the same thing. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Uh, oh, excuse me. New new microphone. Um, look, um, we've got two international fisheries councils that we have to deal with as Alaskans, um, but. One of their points is um, uh, our fishermen get deducted what we're able to catch in halibut because they look out in the Bering Sea and they see us dumping a thousand tons of halibut dead to the bottom of the ocean by factory uh, uh, bottom trawlers. And, um, and so we do have to solve that problem, right? I mean, we need to address the excessive bycatch, especially in the Bering Sea, uh, where you kill over 500,000 chums, but people in Bethel can't fish for chums, um, where you dump over uh, 1,000 tons of halibut dead to the bottom of the ocean, and we do get a majority of seats on the, nor uh, on, on, on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, and we should use those seats uh, to regulate that issue so that we don't have to deal with uh, Canada saying, look, you're wasting your fish over there, uh, you get deducted down in southeast. So um, we should also make sure that we have strong negotiators and strong science in these international commissions so we can get our fair share. People who know how to negotiate, we don't have that right now. So we should pay attention to that, uh, both on the Salmon and the Halibut Commission. And while you have the mic, the next question, follow-up uh, related to that is, there are a number of international issues uh, revolving, uh, involving the fisheries. Right now, there's uh, a wild fish group uh, suing uh, nymphs and it's dragging the Alaska trollers in. Um, how vigorous would you uh, portray your stance on defending Alaska's fisheries to outside interests? I mean, so uh, difficult question in, in one minute, right? Um, we know that in the Southeast, both the halibut and the salmon commission, um, if we don't represent ourselves well, uh, give 
too much of a share to Canadian fishermen and not enough of a share to Alaska fishermen. I mean, it is just crucial uh, that we have people who know how to negotiate. It is just crucial that we have a team of people that provide the science to the people who know how to negotiate. Um, so, I mean, I believe in Alaskanizing our fisheries. Uh, I believe our, you know, fish bind Alaskans, whether you're a sport or commercial or a subsistence fisherman or woman, fish bind Alaskans. We have to make sure our fish are around here, here for the next, um, next generation. Um, in part, it's, it's, it's doing something real about bycatch, uh, um, which, is, which I think is an abomination. Um, and in part, it, it does involve um, having much stronger active representation um, on our international fisheries groups um, so that our fishermen are represented and um, uh, as strongly as the Canadians represent their fishermen. Do, do we hear Governor Walker? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, uh, fisheries is one of the, was a driving one of the driving forces for Alaska to become a state for us to control our own our own fisheries, <clears throat> and then we're sort of we're kind of back to that again. And then as far as controlling our fisheries, it's absolutely paramount that we do uh, that we do that. And and if we don't, then I think you know the sustained yield is is it, it's a constitutional mandate. That uh, that we need need to follow, but it's also a matter of making sure that that we we have um, uh, we have the tools to work with. And I'm a big believer in science, obviously. And science is very important. And decisions to be based upon science and not not based upon politics or who you know who's who's in office, who likes fisheries, who doesn't. It needs to be uh, it needs to be based on long term as well. Uh, short term is, is critical, but long term that, that we don't that we resolve this in such a way that that we have generations of, of uh, commercial fishing industries and family businesses and those getting involved in, in, in fishing industry uh, and generational, not just, not just uh, uh, what, what's, what's, what's the, the fix of the day. Thank you. And we'll begin with you, Governor, with the next question uh, regarding foreign trade. And Alaska's foreign trade is usually Anchorage-centric, so really thinking, uh, you know, in here in the region, we're looking at Prince Rupert, you know, the Pacific Northwest, but and markets beyond, uh, as we look at mariculture and the other natural resources that we have here. Uh, what what would uh, your plan be to encourage foreign trade uh, and and help prioritize uh, investment toward that goal? Well, we you know we need first we need the infrastructure, and and, and a, a good news is we do have you know hundreds of flights a day coming in from, from Asia into, uh, into Alaska, and, and typically they, they return without much product from Alaska. So we need to make sure that we have those, have those products. I, I led a uh, Opportunity Alaska delegation to Asia when I was governor, and as a result of that, a number of businesses have made significant contact with Asia on our, on our seafood. Actually, it was a, one of the beer manufacturers as well. And so it's a matter of, of establishing those relationships uh, and that's one of the roles of the governor is to be the you know, sort of the, the relationship negotiator in chief to sort of create those opportunities for markets to realize that Alaska is, uh, has tremendous opportunity and Alaska sells Alaska, it sells itself. Um, ASME put on a, uh, a seafood uh, banquet for us in Asia uh, and, and boy, it was, uh, um, it was one of the more amazing events that we had over there because of the uh, uh, how much, how much they were, how, how well it was attended, and how much they enjoyed the uh, the seafood that came from Alaska. Thank you, Representative. Yeah, um, look in a minute. I'll focus on seafood. Um, we have the 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 wildest, most sustainable fisheries in the world. We need to keep them that way. Um, you know, the, uh, one of the one of the gems that we have is the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. Um, it has seen less and less state support um, over the years. Um, the less support you provide a, an, an entity that helps build markets for our businesses, that helps build markets for our fishermen, um, the the less you've done for society. So I, I think. Um, uh, Manageable, sustainable state support uh, to the Seafood Marketing Institute, I think, is important. I think it creates jobs. I think uh, it creates trade. Um, obviously, um, I will be an ambassador for the state uh, in places where we can sell our products, and that will be 
part of the job, even though it's not constitutionally part of the job for the governor. Um, so that will be important. But I think we should, uh, I think we should focus on places where we've been successful. And ASME has been very successful and is deserving of a little bit more state support than it's been getting. Thank you. And staying with you, um, talking a little bit about DNR permitting processes that um, are critical to the mariculture industry moving forward. As those permits are filed, citizens have 20 days to appeal, but then DNR has no timeline to complete those comp appeals, which then gets them into that, uh, that black hole of time warps that seem never to emerge. So uh, do you have thoughts on how to expedite uh, the permitting process of this resolution? Yeah, so look, permitting can be slow over a DNR, right? And for the mariculture industry, we've heard that uh, not only is it hard to get a permit to start your business, but it's hard to renew your permit. And, and um, you know, we're many employees down in every single agency. Uh, but when, when you run a state that doesn't have employees, the impact um, is seen in places like permitting, right? And we should, we should coordinate our permitting uh, between DNR and Fish and Game, even the Coast Guard when possible. Um, but there are delays in permitting even just for, for permit renewals. Um, and uh, you're going to keep losing teachers and state employees and police and troopers until you come up with a retirement system that's competitive with those that they can receive outside of the state. That means I, I'm the only candidate in this race who voted against the end of state pensions. I voted against the end of it in 2006. I'm the only candidate in this race that's introduced legislation to reinstate pensions so people have a benefit that will keep them in the state so we can attract and retain workers. And that is part of the problem over at DNR. And that's part of the problem with lagging times on permitting. Thank you. Governor Walker. No, this issue is, is, um, is statewide, and the government services are being uh, delayed in every, in pretty much every facet uh, as a result of lack of, uh, uh, of, of adequate uh, in, in staffing levels. And, and that is absolutely right about uh, uh, when you don't, uh, you don't have an appropriate uh, retirement system, you don't, you're not competitive. You know, we try to be competitive in lots of things, but we're not being competitive what, uh, with state employees and, and, and with programs. So. Uh, this is a this is a, a victim of, of continued uh, reductions, reductions, and we need to decide what kind of an Alaska we want to have and how we're going to pay for it. And there's a number of options on that, but let's start with what we want to have. What are our values? Uh, how high do we value government services, education, etc.? And then how we uh, we fit in the uh, the revenues to to make sure that it's it's fully funded. Thank you. And staying with you, Governor, the. Potential value of minerals in Southeast has been estimated at over a billion dollars, and that is with a B. Uh, most of those are federal lands, but how could the state work with the federal government to uh, really map out and inventory those deposits, and would this be a priority of yours to create wealth in the region? It, it is, would be a pri high priority of mine. We had a chance to uh, spend a over half a day at Sundance Mine on Prince of Wales um, Island a few months ago. And boy, what a, what a project, what a mine that is as far as local employment and just the way they, they've gone about putting that mine together. So there are tremendous opportunities. You know, specifically your, your question, and let me also say I think it's uh, appropriate to bring back um, coastal zone management. I think that there's an, op I think local input is critical at the early uh, schedules and, and so we would bring that back. As far as the federal government, you work with the federal government by sitting down and spending time with them. I probably spent uh, 15 or 20 meetings with Secretary Jewell on some of the permitting issues in Alaska. You, you engage with them, you build a relationship, whether you get along with them or not is sort of secondary. You build a relationship and say, this is what we need for our economy to work. And, um, and I've been very successful in that approach uh, at all levels, levels of government. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Mark Myers has been a, a leader in various positions of the Department of Natural Resources over the years. And what Mark will tell you is that instead of just always bashing the federal government, look, I can get a press release any day that I want to bash the federal government, and it just gets me a press release, and it might get me a vote, but it doesn't move the ball forward. Uh, in terms of minerals mapping, um, the cooperation between our DNR and, and USGS on the federal level, they have cooperated 
both on, 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 on uh, mapping on state lands and federal lands. The feds help us map on state lands, we help map on federal lands. USGS does some of the best mapping in the world and there have been technological improvements with drones and, and uh, look, we need that, right? I mean, you need mapping so you can know, look, is there a deposit, but is that next to arsenic, which is next to a fish, fishing stream? Like mapping is very important. I will say I will not, I will not trade fish for mines, but we do have a responsible mining history in the state. Um, but that's where I draw the line, and that's why I oppose the pebble mine, and Governor Denlevy supports the pebble mine. Uh, but we've had a responsible mining history in the state, especially in Southeast. Um, we can have a continued responsible mining history in the state. Mining jobs are important as long as we're not trading one resource uh, for another. So, uh, but mapping is important for that. You get to map where the toxins are. You get to map where the toxins are not. And, um, and I think you get to map to find out those, those deposits that are closer to tidewater where you won't contaminate a stream. And I think that's important too. Thank you. So the next question is going to ask each of you if you have a, a, a priority project or industry that you think would be key to support here in the region. And I'll just, just preface that by just saying, you know, with the COVID pandemic uh, really just decimated and put the brakes on every economy, but no region in the state was hit as hard as Southeast Alaska. So we're, we're on, on the rebound. Last year's theme was just getting through to 22. So uh, we did that. We're here. There's a sense of optimism. There's some growing momentum uh, on a number of fronts. but. Uh, what, what, would, what would something tangible look like that you think that uh, you could give support for, for new economic ventures or expansion of, uh, of the Southeast economy? And um, we'll start with you, Representative. Thank you very much. Look, um, I think startup companies are important. I think uh, we have a, an agency, the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, ADA, and they keep investing in 1960s projects, right? It's a 1960s agency. Um, all they do, it seems, is look for mines that nobody knows anything about and subsidize $30 million roads to mine prospects that we don't know anything about. The latest one, Governor Denlevy, has spent $30 million to subsidize a road into uh, the upper Susitna Basin to mines we know nothing about. But we should be using ADA, I think, instead to build the next economy, the new economy. Look, I, I'm, I'm pro-mining, but mine should, uh, Jay Hammond would say, a mine should have to pay for its own way or else it's, it's not viable. Uh, but we should be using ADA to, to, to issue low interest loans to help businesses start up mariculture, for example, right? I mean, ADA could do a world of good in, in this expanding industry of mariculture. Congratulations on the $49 million grant. That's amazing. Um, we need to look through to a future economy, not just the past economy. Mining is here to stay, but we need to use ADA also to look towards the future. Thank you. Governor Walker. You know, I've been really pleased with what I've seen happening in the Southeast on the tourism development. I recently sat through a, a briefing on uh, the Hunatona project, a uh, very exciting project, what they've accomplished, what their goals are. <clears throat> That's one of one of several opportunities that, that we're aware of. I've, I've um, reviewed um, Alaska's uh, Southeast uh, Sustainable Plan, the, the Southeast Trust. Um, I think this tourism is, is, is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for development in, uh, in Southeast. You know, obviously the mariculture, I was thrilled to, to see the $49 million um, grant from, we've come a long way since the creation of the Mariculture Trust in, in uh, 2016. We signed, a, we signed it, I believe, on the Hump Island, the, some tremendous oysters. So I think that the mariculture is, is, a, is a very untapped opportunity. You know, there's most likely some infrastructure that needs to be done. Uh, in addition to the 49 million, I know the state has put money in as well. So, you know, I think that's a, a tremendous opportunity as well. So is the mariculture uh, in Southeast and all coastal Alaska. Thank you. So taking a look at unorganized boroughs and the fact that the legislature is by de facto the assembly for that local government, uh, here in Southeast, we have a number of communities inside unorganized boroughs, and they have a, a, a need to try to capture specifically fish taxes that could possibly help, um, you know, some of the impacts that occur with, uh, with the charter fisheries that, that are there in the lodges, et cetera. Um, is there a way that you see the state could make provision through the fish tax collection to support some of the unorganized borough activities? 
I, I'm all ears, right? Um, so, um, you know, the fish tax is important to local communities. Um, I, I don't believe in forcing communities to organize into boroughs. If you're unorganized, um, I don't believe in forcing you to pay for schools that you can't afford and pay for utilities that you can't afford. Um, but I think that is a relevant question of, of, the, of the natural resources that are providing revenue. Should you share in those? And I think it's fair, right? I'm a, it's, a, it's something I would lean towards doing if, if, I, if we could work on a rational proposal to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like we, what we do in, in Western Alaska with CDQ groups. We, we let communities share in the bounty of their, of their natural resources. Um, and, and in turn, uh, that, that helps uh, the people in local communities, especially local communities where people have, have, have less income. Uh, you know, the CDQ group in, uh, in Dillingham um, uh, helps helps um, helps people buy back fishing permits or buy fishing permits when so many of them are being sold to out of staters. Um, so we can Alaskanize our fisheries again. So yes, I mean I, I think it's something I would love to consider. Um, I'd love to see a proposal, uh, but I don't believe in forced borrowization. I, I don't believe in doing that. We'd have to listen to people in the communities. Thank you, Governor Walker. You know, and this issue has been around for a while. And I actually took a look at. I actually worked as a city attorney for uh, City of Pollock. Uh, many many years ago you know part of the uh, one of the options was considered is maybe the fish tax would go to communities where the off where the fish are caught not necessarily where they're landed and so that was one concept that was that was circulated some uh, some time ago you know there has to be a way of connecting our our, our economy with the uh, the services that are provided and the local governments provide a tremendous amount of services to uh to that industry the sport industry sport fishing industry and others so uh i i do look to local governments for for uh, their their ideas and input, rather than rather than you know mandates, uh, government mandates upon them, but certainly we would look uh, look at that, and that was something typically community regional affairs would be involved in, and and certainly uh, now that's been blended, of course, in other other Department of Commerce, but I think that's uh, something worth looking at, and if if there's revenue opportunities there, I think it should be uh, should be explored. All right, thank you. Um, we're not going to get to all the questions, but uh, if uh, in your closing remarks you could kind of address. Uh, how are you going to pay for things? Um, okay, we'll do one more. We'll leave that as a, we'll leave that as a standalone question. Okay, so we'll, um, we, we know you both are on the record as supporting a lot of what is considered to be essential services. So um, if you would answer the question there, and uh, revenues versus cuts, how do we have a sustainable budget that more closely matches revenue in with expenditures out once these federal funds uh, expire? Governor Walker? Well, a couple of things. The year before, I, when I came in, our budget was about eight billion, so we brought it down to about four point three, which it is, which it is today. You no know, further cuts are just very, very painful, very painful, and, I, and we're, we're seeing and we've been hearing about that in the questions today. You know, from a revenue standpoint, we need to make sure that we're getting, you know, things are balanced. I, I'm not a believer in looking at just one particular industry, but obviously we need to look, take a hard look at the, the tax credits up on the slope. There's no question about that. We did that when I was in office on the. On the exploration credits, and and I think we need to look at that again on the on the uh, on the production side as well, just to make sure that that makes sense. Um, you know, I think we need to find out, decide if you know, we, you know, on a full fiscal plan. You know, we, uh, you know, a governor doesn't make that decision, but the governor provides the leadership for that. That's what we've been missing for the last four years. There's no leadership on the fiscal plan at all. And the legislature, I believe, they're ready for a fiscal plan. We submitted a full fiscal plan. Uh, they they adopted a significant piece of it on the. Uh, uh, Permanent Fund Protection Act. We're now funding 70% of government, rev government res revenues services are coming from the Permanent Fund earnings on a sustainable draw. That needs to be completed and finished, and we'll do that. But we need a, a full fiscal plan, and not just pull on one lever or the other lever and say, lever and say we're we're good. So we've got to we've got to look at it holistically and and get our get our, uh, uh, our revenues in order and find out you know how we're going to fund our our resource. We have a number of options available. It just can take it's going to take working together as a last minute to do that. Thank you, and Representative Gear. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, is, is this no, 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 go ahead and answer the budget question. Budget then, question. Then we'll give you your three minutes. Okay, for, this isn't yeah, closing. Okay, bonus yeah. round. Uh, budget question. Look, uh, former Representative Munoz knows this. Um, uh, uh, Senator Keel knows this. The easiest thing to say in Juneau is that you're going to cut the budget, but at some point it becomes the dumbest thing you can do. Because right now, at this level, you're cutting jobs. You're cutting 
the future for people to be able to live in the state anymore. Um, the, except for this one year of, of Russian oil money, uh, um, this state has had a construction and community project budget that is 75% lower than it was in 2014. I've talked about oil revenue getting a fair share. $1.2 billion will go a long way. But that means restoring the construction budget so we can put people back to work again. The 75% cut to the capital budget, that's cost 4,000 jobs. That's what ICER estimates. It's cost us 4,000 jobs. 20,000 more people have left the state under this governor than have moved here. And the capital budget is a big part of that. People need to know that there is a future of jobs, a future where they can rely on public education, and people don't see either the ability to rely on our schools in the future uh, or the ability to say, you know, there's going to be a job for my kid uh, in the state five years or 10 years from now. Those things are very important. So while you have the mic. We will now go to closing statements uh, of your choosing for three minutes, please. Thank you. Um, look, I appreciate uh, former Governor Walker being here. Sometimes I feel like only two of us are running for governor. Um, so we've had seven debates so far. <laughs> I would say I think only two of us care enough about running for governor. That's what I would say. Um, um, We've had seven debates so far. Um, the current governor has attended, has missed six of those seven. Um, look, if you're scared to share your ideas with people, don't run. If you're scared to listen to people, don't run. I mean, the best information sometimes you get is hearing from people, right? Uh, that's why I'm here in Ketchikan. That's why I've been to every single debate there's been in this election. Um, and uh, if you're going to duck debates, then I just don't think you're worthy of being elected. That's my personal view. Look, we haven't addressed some issues I think that are very important. Here's an economic issue. I I'm pro-choice. I believe a woman has the right to choose, and I don't believe that government has the right to tell a woman what to do with her body. I believe you get to marry who you want to marry, and I don't get to tell you who you get to marry. And if this state goes the way Governor Dunleavy wants us to go and tells people they don't have their reproductive freedom rights and tells people that he gets to decide who they get to love, these people are leaving the state. And we will continue, our biggest export will continue to be human beings and people. Our biggest export is already people, 20,000 more people leaving the state than moving here over the last four years for the reasons that you've heard, neglecting the management of the state. But if you want, if you want to empty the state of workers and you want to have no future, um, <laughs> you can go ahead and tell people they don't ha women they don't have their right to, to control their own body and people that they don't get to choose who they get to marry. In my world, I don't get to tell you what you do with your body. I don't get to tell you who you get to marry. These are important things and I believe that, that those citizens are equal citizens. They should have equal rights in the state and they should feel comfortable about staying in the state. And I don't want to chase our most talented workers out of the state, but this assault on women's rights and this assault on equal rights is going to chase people out of the state. I want to welcome people to stay, the state, to stay in the state. I want this to be a strong state. And those are very strong workers, some of the most talented workers in the state. That is important to me. You have heard my other uh, priorities. We need to be able to fund a budget again. We need to make sure sure that we have money in the state again to do the housing things we need to do and the child care things we need to do and to build an economy again. And that means not cutting the budget because at this point you're cutting jobs. So um, look, I believe in a strong future. I'm only running because look, I had a chance to survive, to succeed in this world. I, you know, I got to be an assistant attorney general on the Exxon Valdez oil spill case to do the civil prosecution against Exxon. I was proud to do that. I've had my chances in life, even though I, I grew up in foster care. I believe everybody deserves the chance to succeed, whether you're born rich or poor, and everybody deserves their rights, whether you're a woman or you're a man, or whether you're gay or you're not gay. I believe in an inclusive society that, that treats people with respect. Those are my core beliefs. I would appreciate your vote um, uh, uh, in November. And I will tell you, I'm going to put Governor Walker down second. He, he's shown up. He's the only candidate who's shown up. So he and I are the only ones. Thank you. I, I would ask you in rank choice voting to please rank at least two people. Please, that's the only way it works. And so I have committed that my second choice vote is going to um, former Governor Walker. My first vote is going to me and Jessica. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I, that's just the way I feel, right? I, but but um, 
but please, just in ranked choice voting, it does not work if you don't rank at least two people, at least on the state level. Um, uh, so please do that. Um, I can't believe I'm sitting here pitching a second place vote for my opponent, <laughs> but, but he's shown up, I've shown up. You should, you should ask yourself, is somebody scared to share their plan with you or are, they, or are they proud to share their plan with you? And I'm proud to share my plan with you. And I'm proud to stand up for women's rights. And I'm proud to stand up for our LGBTQ plus community. And I am proud to say this, that I will never try to get a vote off a population, 40% of whom think about committing suicide at some point in their life. That is LGBTQ and trans kids, that 40% think about committing suicide in their life, and we've got a governor tweeting about how he wants to discriminate against them. I am not gonna do that. I do not want a single vote off, off, off pushing uh, kids who are already in dangerous circumstances into more dangerous circumstances. I will lead in an inclusive way, I will lead in a bipartisan way, but I will lead in a way that's respectful to people. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Governor Walker, the final word is yours. Your closing statement, please. Very good. Thank you. And thank you very much, Southeast Conference, for, for holding this. Um, you are you're here. You've been in existence longer than our state has. And, and uh, I, I applaud and appreciate that very much. Your, your continued passion on the Marine Highway system is, is to be commended. And you are always part of the solution, never the problem. So I, I thank you for the, the hard work you've done on that. You know, both Heidi and I were born in, in Alaska. Um, Don and I have uh, four children. Uh, six or five or six grandchildren are here in Alaska. Uh, Kevin and, and Heidi have uh, um, Olive, who is four and a half years old. We, we, we are doing this because of the life we had growing up in Alaska, living in Alaska all of our lives. And, and we see the path we're on. We are absolutely on the wrong path. We're on the, uh, not a path for prosperity at all. You know, we are not, we do have tremendous opportunities in Alaska, but if we continue to do fight amongst ourselves rather than working together, we're not going to get it done. You know, I think that the federal government is a, it can be a tremendous impediment. Uh, they own and control 62% of our, of our land. We need to work collaboratively with them. And, and I certainly would continue to do that as I did before. That means right on Air Force One with the president, I'll do that. I did that with both presidents, I'll do that again, because you have to sit down and, and build a relationship. You know, as far as the uh, the issue of women's rights, you know, our constitution is absolutely clear uh, about protecting a woman's right to choose. And I will veto any legislation that infringes upon that or gets between a woman and her doctor. I absolutely do not disagree with, with Les on, on that issue and on the uh, LBGT as well. But you know, it's really, the, it's really the tone of Alaska that concerns me. And I've just not seen a, such a partisan tone uh, in my lifetime here, and and we have we have brought in with this governor, we have brought in Washington style politics. We brought in three million dollars of dark money, uh, 36 hours before the law changed. We have, you know, um, you're going to see plenty of ads against me, and and you, I'm sure you already have because they realize uh, I'm a threat to uh, to this this uh, uh, the sitting governor, and I will be aggressive in uh, in everything I do. I'll be open and transparent. We won't. Uh, transgressions will not be hidden as they have been in this administration. Uh, it's, it's, we need to get back to being Alaskans again. We need to be a, one state working together and not uh, divided up and torn apart between different fiscal issues. The bipartisan infrastructure bill is transformational for Alaska. It's equivalent to the Alcan Highway, it's equivalent to the trans alaska Oil Pipeline, but only if we go after it and embrace it and aggressively go after it and compete with other states for that. And that's exactly what we will do. We'll bring every single dollar back that's uh, been, made, been available as a result of the hard work of Don Young, uh, Senator Mikowski, and, and Senator Sullivan. So it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. I'm, I'm running because of the opportunities of Alaska, and we are just absolutely on the wrong path. We need leadership. We need somebody who will show up, not just show up at debates. And, and, and you know that's pretty insulting to this group, but not even to, not even to be on Zoom. And uh, and you know, also we'll show up and work with the legislature. You know, it's a team sport, and I, the legislature uh, has a tough job to do. And the governor's role is to sit down and work with them, and not always point the finger and blame them on on uh, when, when a person doesn't get what they want. So we need to become Alaskans again and get the job done and make sure we have a prosperous future for our our children and grandchildren going forward. Thank you, sir.
I want to thank both of you for participating. When the invitations went out over a month ago, Governor Walker called within an hour to send his regrets that he had already committed to be out of uh, at another commitment, uh, but he pledged to be here by, via Zoom, so we appreciate that. And uh, Representative Garrett for making the effort to come down here. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to engage uh, those of you that are, uh, are championing the causes that mean something uh, a lot to us. So. Thank you for that, and uh, we will invite the, the next panel to come forward. We're not, this is not break time, so we're going to stay in the groove, <laughs> so don't go all the way. The only thing you can do is take advantage of the QR codes which have been updated on your table to also include the 15% discount on Alaska Airlines. So, Governor, you might get that link too. You might need it as much as you're moving around, and uh, <laughs> Representative Guerra. And um, Representative Garrett will be here for a bit while this afternoon, so if you want to step out uh, and have a chat with him, uh, please, uh, please go ahead and take advantage of that. Energy panel, come on forward. One more round of applause, please, for these two great champions. I have some materials out front.